Well, that's exciting, isn't it? You know, as I was sharing last night, you know, God has blessed the work here in Australia. We baptized five Sunday church pastors last year uh, in Queensland. Uh, we're, I'm studying, we're studying with one at the moment who is uh, pastoring a Pentecostal church uh, for 1,500 people. And uh, God is moving. God is moving everywhere. And, you know, the key is to work with the media and with the local church. And the amazing fact is Oceana really wants to do that. And we spend a lot of time pulling those two together, training members, uh, training like this weekend, and training with the F- Amazing Facts Center of Evangelism, as well as going to churches and helping out with resources for evangelism, Bible study guides, lessons, resources, and so on. And that's the reason why we have the newsletter, so that we can resource you in your work in sharing Christ to other people. My brother Etienne just came back from Kenya, and God has blessed his work there. I think they have 4,500 baptisms throughout all the sites there. And I think you were saying to me today that there are another 180 baptisms for your sites, isn't it? Just today on Sabbath, praise the Lord. So that's what Amazing Facts is all about. Amazing Facts in Australia is very different in the sense that we're not a production company. We don't produce content. We're much about connecting churches to the media and to the contact. That's what we're all about, and resourcing the churches. So that's a blessing that we can do. Today, uh, my message today is entitled, Jesus' um, Method for Church Growth. Jesus' Method for Church Growth. Let me see whether I can get the slice up there. Okay. Oh, there we go. Okay. Jesus' Method for Church Growth. Let me quickly move that. As you know, I serve as a director for Amazing Facts, as a volunteer director, and it's a blessing to be involved in this. So... I, I see a lot of news story happening around Australia, and I, you want to keep in touch on that, so sign up on the newsletter. Um, if you are interested in signing up to be a Bible worker, to be trained, to soul winning, we have a school, so come and consider that option as well. We are moving that school online so that you can access it from your home, as well as come to experience it in soul winning churches. Um, and of course, some of you know that I work in a wellness center as well. We run a wellness center because I believe health and the gospel works together especially reaching the urban population. We need the both of them working together. Today I'm going to cover about Jesus' method for growth, and this afternoon we talk about training small group leaders and how to run evangelistic small group. That's what we do this afternoon. Again, the textbook's available. We actually brought some resources available. If you're interested in it, there's a sign-up sheet for this textbook as well. Uh, there's a cost to this, but it's good to have this resource for you in doing your personal work. You know, you, when, when you're sharing the gospel to people, how to do it. A very practical application is found here. And of course, um, some of you will be familiar with my book. I, I, I wrote a book called Business Unusual, which is teaching uh, churches how to transform to do business unusual. Because we live in unusual time, right? We need to do, we cannot do things business as usual. Going back to the New Testament model for church growth. Let us pray as we get into the Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Word of God. And we thank you for this time that we can study your word. I pray, Father, that your hearts, uh, your heart will be, uh, that our hearts will be aligned to your hearts. That our heart will be open to the Spirit. Oh, Father, I pray that no one will leave this place. No one will leave this place unless they are attended by the Spirit. Let them go, go out of here, that the Lord has spoken to them, that they've been inspired, they've been encouraged. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's turn our Bibles to Matthew chapter 10. Jesus gave his, instru- his disciples instructions on how to grow his church. And indeed, we know Jesus is coming soon. And indeed, we must share the kingdom of Jesus to the world. And so Jesus did not hold back. He actually gave us instructions of how to do the work. When he called the twelve, he started to give them the clear instruction. In Matthew chapter 10, reading verse 11, the Bible says that, Into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till you go hence. And when you come into a house, salute it. And, when you, and, and if the houses be worthy, let your peace come upon it, but if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And whosoever shall not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of this house or the city, shake off the dust of your feet. Now you might be familiar with this instruction. Jesus said to go and reach a, a city. We want to reach a city like Astonville or Brisbane or Gold Coast or, or Kulangata. How do I reach the city? And Jesus' instruction to the disciples were very, very simple. Go into and find a house. 
Isn't that clear? It's so simple. Go into the house. Look at the repeated word in this passage. Household. It's a household. Household. House. Do you understand? Jesus is telling us the method of how he reaches the city. To go into a household. I think it's clear. Because before that, Jesus said to the disciples, don't bring your money back, don't bring your, your, your tunic and all that, but just depend on me. Depend on me, but go into a house. Now, when Jesus called the 70, he gave the same instructions again. Come with me to Luke chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, you will see Jesus giving the same instruction to the 70. First the 12, then the 70. Now, if Jesus repeats this, it must be important. If the method that he shared here is also important, that means our home is an important asset for Jesus. I always tell my wife, this house don't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. I know you have a mortgage with a bank, but it still belongs to Jesus. Do you understand what I'm saying? This house does not belong to us. It is Jesus' house. It is his asset. In Luke chapter 10, we see this in verse 2. The Bible says, Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he may send forth laborers into his harvest. So the harvest truly is plentiful. I truly believe that. I truly believe that the Spirit of God is moving in Australia. I was just talking to a brother here and a sister here, who recently came back to the Lord because of God stirring the heart because of COVID. Last month, we had Bible study with a, a lady who, her heart was stirred. Her husband been Adventist for 20 years, but she was a typical Aussie girl, a lady that did not want to know God. She was into sports every weekend when she grew up, and she did not want to know God. But then when COVID hit, she began to go online and say, what is going on in this world? And she began to study, and at first looking into conspiracy theory and all that sort of stuff, but then she began to study the book of Revelation, and it dawned on her what is happening in the world that we live in. We just baptized her last month. She watched Amazing Facts. Watched all Pastor Doug Bachelor's sermon about Revelation. And it made sense. She studied the Gospel and Jesus made sense to her. And today we're praying for her two kids. And we know that God is using her in the home. She lives in the region of Victoria. My friends, the Spirit of God is moving. The harvest truly is plenteous out there. But the problem is the laborers. It's not a problem of finding new programs, a new fancy method, new fancy approach. The problem is the laborers. And the laborers is described here as we go further. Notice what the laborers are supposed to do. Luke chapter 10, reading verse 5. And into whatsoever house he entered, first say, Peace to be to the house, to this house. And if the Son of Peace be there, your peace shall return, shall rest upon it. If it's not, it shall turn to you again. And in the same house remain, eating and drinking thus, such things as they give, for the laborer is worthy of his hire. Do not go from house to house. It's interesting, isn't it? House, 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 house. We sometimes miss the point. I, I, I find it bizarre that in the church that we live in, and there some church, sometimes we're thinking of new fancy approach. We think of new satellite approach. We think of new programming. Don't get me wrong. I'm not against those ideas. I think it's great to upgrade some of the programs and, and resource and material. Those are great ideas. We need to do that. But at the end of the day, people listening to all that stuff needs to come to a home. They need to connect with people. They need to build friendship. Because it's easier to build friendship in the home than it is. To just come to a program. The home, I don't know about you, I'm Chinese, and Chinese people love food. Right? We love eating together. Is it something, some of the Pacific Island culture looks like that? When you eat together, you're suddenly friends forever, you know what I mean? So you might be new to a church, you might be new to a church, and you just came and somebody invited you home for Sabbath lunch. And you have a beautiful Sabbath afternoon with them. You had a good few hours eating together. And the next Sabbath, when you come to church and you look at them, how do you feel? Wow, you feel like family. You feel like friends. Do you understand what I'm saying? So, it is important for us to use our homes because our homes don't belong to us. It belongs to Jesus. Because Jesus used this method. He instructed the 12 this way. He instructed the 70 this way. But you know, the, the great thing I love about Jesus is this. Jesus doesn't only do the talk. He does the walk as well. He models it. He demonstrates it. Come with me to Luke chapter 19. 
And you see Jesus modeling this. Jesus wants to reach the oldest city in the world. The oldest city in the world is called Jericho. Jericho, and Jesus came by in, in Luke chapter 19. Jesus came by Jericho. The Bible tells us in verse 1, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and he could not for the press because he was a little of stature. So here's a man called Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus was the chief tax collector. He was the publican. Zacchaeus had everything in life. He had a great house, he had a great real estate, he had great influence, he had a great job. But one thing he didn't have, one thing that didn't satisfy him, one thing that he did not have, is that he didn't have that peace and contentment that only Jesus could give. You can have everything in this world. You can have all the job you want. But if you don't have Jesus, it's meaningless. I know what's it like. I was a Laudation Seventh-day Adventist for many years. I was ch- chasing my corporate career. I was busy climbing up the corporate ranks. I was making my money. And I was getting influence and power. I, I rise up to lead uh, an organization in the, in the Asia-Pacific region looking after 23 countries with thousands of staff, four general managers reporting to me, and I had influence, I had power, I could buy, I could sell, I could do anything I want. But you know, you chase the world, the world, the things of this world will never satisfy us. You chase one deal after the next deal, you might get the exhilaration at the start, but after a day or two, it's forgotten. You might go plan your vacation to, this, to Bali and then next to Europe and then next to America, it'd be all forgotten. There's no satisfaction in that. You might be happy with your pay rise, maybe just for a moment, but after you heard your, your colleague got a better rise than yours, you go, what's going on? Or you get upset. We're never satisfied. Things of this world doesn't satisfy. And Zacchaeus was like that. He had everything he wanted. He had all the money, the position, and the power, and the influence, but he had emptiness in his life. And he heard of this man called Jesus. And Jesus, he wanted to see. So the Bible tells us he came. The Bible tells us that he came and to, he sought to see Jesus but could not. What's the problem? The Bible described him as rich in one verse and the next verse describes him as what? He was short in stature or vertically challenged or somebody says. He was short. You know, the crowd was with Jesus. Jesus was, they were speaking to Je- Jesus, speaking to them, and the crowd was all over there, and he tried to push himself in, he, he, and they didn't want to bow of him. Because he was that nasty guy that keeps take, taking money from us year on year. He's got extra tax that he's taken money from them. So they were very upset. He, could, he was very upset. He couldn't see Jesus because he really longed to see Jesus because he knew Jesus had healed many people. Jesus had filled the life of many people. My friends, if you live in this world today chasing for every ambition you have but you don't have Jesus in your life, you'll be like Zacchaeus, feeling empty. And God has this uncanny way to stir our hearts and to realize that it's time return to Jesus. And maybe some of you are on that journey today. You've been too busy. Your family has missed you. You've been soaked up by your work and your career. But your kids miss you. They haven't seen Jesus through you. Maybe today God is speaking to you. How can, be, how can I come back to God? And Zacchaeus, he came up with an idea. And he decided to do what? The Bible tells us in verse 4. And he ran before. He knew that was the path Jesus was going. He ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree. What kind of tree is that? Now, question. Why a sycamore tree? Why does the Bible use the word sycamore tree? A tree is a tree. You just climb a tree. But why on earth do we have the word sycamore there? By the way, has anybody seen a sycamore tree? You seen a sycamore tree? Yes. I saw that in Jericho when I went on my Babylon tour. Did you guys see that in Jericho? 
and there was a park there, and there was a second more tree. And I was thinking, I was reading this passage, standing in, outside the park, and, and I go, of course, that's not the tree that Zacchaeus climbed back then, thousands of years ago, but it was a tree that is in this park in Jericho. And I looked at this tree, and it dawned on me, why a second more tree? Why the Bible is so particular? The Bible don't waste words for no reason. And I began to realize, and I look at the branches, it makes sense. You know why? The second more tree don't, branches don't go up like that. They go like this. It's very good for a short man. So, so Zacchaeus, he didn't care. He wanted to see Jesus desperately. He didn't care. He didn't care that he was wearing his Giorgio Armani three-piece suit. And he climbed up wearing his Rolex watch on the tree, waiting for time for Jesus to come. And I love this story. You know why? Because the Bible says in verse 5, When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him. In our emptiness, in our loneliness, in our desperation for meaning and purpose in life, Jesus comes to you. Jesus does not leave Zacchaeus hanging dry there. Jesus knew the need of his heart. Jesus knew the emptiness of his heart. And Jesus comes to him. Today, my friends, coming to church is not an accident. That breakthrough you're looking for, that relationship challenge that is, you're struggling with the kids and the in-laws, my friends, Jesus comes to you because He knows the need of your heart. He wants to feel Zacchaeus' heart like He wants to feel your heart today. But Zacchaeus was there up in the tree. And children, remember this song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man. He climbed up to the... For Jesus he wanted to see. Now you know the chorus. Zacchaeus said, Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down for I'm going to your house to... What does he say? For I'm going to your house to... Today. For I'm going to your house today, right? Now that's not a theologically correct. It should be... I'm going to your house to stay. That's what it, it means in Greek. Because the Bible says, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at your house, or stay in your house. Or the Greek word here is meno. Meno is the same Greek word you find in John 15. If you abide in me and I in you, the same brings for mushroom. Abide is the word meno. And Jesus said, I'm not doing a house visitation today. I am going to stay in your house. Isn't that Matthew 10? Isn't that Luke 10? When Jesus gave the instruction to the 12 and the 17, that you find a house and abide in the house and operate from that house. And Jesus models this and come to Zacchaeus' house. I tell you, when, Zacchaeus come, when Jesus comes to Zacchaeus' house, and Jesus begins to fill his, the life of Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus' life begins to transform. When Jesus comes into your heart, your life begins to change for the better. That fear, that loneliness, that uncertainty of the future, Jesus' words will calm that soul of yours. He will calm the spirit of your heart. He will give you meaning and purpose. And, Zac- and Zacchaeus was transformed, the Bible says. The Bi- he, he was so delighted and he changed. And what did Zacchaeus decide to do with, half of, with, with his wealth? How, many, how much did he give it away? What did the Bible say in verse 8? How much did he give it away? Half of his goods, isn't it? And how much did he recompense compensate the people that he fraudulently took the money from? How many times did he compensate that for? Four times. Now, question. If you live in Jericho and Zacchaeus took $10,000 extra tax from you for his personal gain, do you think the grapevine will operate in Jericho and say that Zacchaeus is giving back four times the amount? You think the word will get around? Oh, you better believe it. The word will get around. So question. 
How are you going to get your money back? How would you get your money back? There's no PayPal. There's no FPOS. There's no ATM machines. How would you get your money back? You go to his house, isn't it? And all these years he swindled your money. All these years he had a bad reputation. All these years he has taken extra cash for himself rather than the Roman Empire. You come stomping to the house because he took $10,000 extra. You knock on the door. Zacchaeus. I heard around town that you're giving back four times the amount. Last year you took $10,000 from me extra. You know what Zacchaeus would do? I'm sorry. Here's your, I'm going to give it back four times. 10000 20000 30000 40000 Do you know what you would do? He quickly take the money. He put it in the sun to make sure it's real. He's not faking it. And you look, it's real. Real money. You look at Zacchaeus. What's wrong with you, man? You gone bananas? You gone crazy? All these years you take our money. What's wrong with you? You know what Zacchaeus would say? Come on in. Come in. Let me introduce a friend that changed my life. He filled my emptiness of my life. Money didn't buy me any peace. Let me introduce you to my friend. His name is Jesus. He can make a difference for you too. Jesus stayed in this house. Jesus wasn't doing a house visitation. He operated in Jericho from this house. Let me ask you the next question. Do you think all of Jericho will hear the gospel of Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus' method is so simple. It's so simple. We try to find new ways of doing outreach, but it is so simple. Jesus' method is always to find a home where a life is transformed. And you tell the story of a transformed life like Zacchaeus' life, and people will find Jesus Christ. You know, too often we get it all upside down. We, 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 we tell people, you better, you better believe in this message. You believe in, the, uh, in the Jesus. You believe in second coming. You believe in, in Sabbath. You better believe the sanctuary. You better believe the prophecy. We, we teach them to believe, right? And then after they learn about Sabbath and about the uh, sanctification and health message, we say, you better behave. You better conform to all this. And then we let you belong to our seven day Adventist church. Do you understand? We go from the concept of belief to behave than to belong. But I see Jesus turning it upside down. Jesus said, come. Come into my home. Come and get to know me. Meet Zacchaeus. And hear his story. Hear his testimony. Come and have belonging. And in the context of belonging, you're open to believing. When you're open to believing, then you'll be transformed. Belong, believe, be transformed. That's the model of that's why we open our homes. Because it's in the homes that somebody has close proximity to your transformed life. When they can see your transformed life, they might be open to believing. You've been praying for that family member for so long. But the question is not, whether the Holy Spirit is moving or not. The Spirit is moving, but the Spirit is watching your life. They are watching your life. You are the walking Bible. Is it conform? Is it transform to the Word of God? That's what God is waiting for. Your children that's walked away from church, they are waiting to see a transformed life. They're tired of the hypocrisy in church. They're tired of the fact that mom and dad argues and look so angry with one another and they look like angels when they come to church. They're tired of that. They want to see a transformed home. Because it all starts with love at home. 
Amen. And Zacchaeus was transformed. And the love of Jesus overflowed out of his home to the community. And that's what God is looking for in the home. Petra and Prophets made this uh, desire. I just made this interesting quote. Not only was Zacchaeus himself blessed, but all the, his household with him. Christ went into his home to give him a lesson of truth and to instruct his household in the things of the kingdom. They had been shut out of the sin God by the contempt of the rabbis and the worshippers. But now the most favored household in all of Jericho, they gathered in their own home about the divine teacher and heard for themselves the words of life. It was when, Jesus, when Christ is received as a personal savior that salvation comes to the soul. Zacchaeus have received Jesus, not merely as a passing guest in his home, but, one, but as one to abide in the soul temple. Did you get it? Can you see how many times the author of Desire I just used the word household, homes and household and home? Can you see how many times? He's almost intentionally trying to tell us that's the model. That's the model we're trying to get to. And no wonder when you read this, you're not surprised in the book of Acts. The same concept. Paul, the great evangelist, the great author, the author of many books in the, in the New Testament, basically said this. He taught them publicly and from house to house. You know, we as, as a church, sometimes very comfortable just to do things in church. But to open up our home seems to be a challenge. I have asked the church elder, one of my church elders, he has a care group in his house, and he's got three kids. He runs his own business. A mom homeschooled the kids and so on. They're very busy. Uber driver, Monday to Friday, bringing kids to, to activities and so on. Very busy. But they run a care group in their house every Friday night. And many visitors come to this household. This house. I asked the elder, why do you open up your home? Is it for all these, all these guests and visitors and friends that are coming? He said, yes, but primarily it's for my children. Because I want my children to see mission. I don't want them just to read about mission story or watch uh, Adventist mission news. I want them to see mission every week. And mission happens in this home. When a new guest come and the family worship the next day, the family will worship to, will, during worship time will say, let's pray for our friend that's been coming. The children begin to learn to pray together with the parents and to do mission together. One of the reasons why we lose a lot of kids out of the Sunday Adventist church is because the, the children don't see us walk the talk. They see us just give lip service. Oh, we've got to do mission. Oh, we need to share Christ. I don't, they don't see in action. But what a best way to do it in the home group, in a care group setting, where the parents and the children are doing mission together, reaching out to their neighbors and their friends. This is real life. And I think that makes a difference in the life of people. You know, the formation of small companies as a basis of Christian effort has been presented to me by one who cannot err. If there is a large number in the church, let the members be formed into small companies to work not only for the church members, but for unbelievers. If in one place there are only two or three who knows the truth, let them form themselves into a band of workers. Small companies, small groups. That's the model we grew this movement many years ago. You know how the work started in Australia? It was very similar. The work in Australia started in 1885 when the Adventist pioneers came to Melbourne. And one of the methods they used was Bible reading for the home. And Bible reading for the home is just small groups reading in the home. And that's what they did. And then they teach a tent and they held an evangelistic meeting to reap the harvest from that process. Within one year of the five families that came to Melbourne from America to start the work in Australia in 1885, within one year, they planted the first church with 90 people. By the second year, they had 221 people. By the, by the year 1891, when Alan White came to visit Australia, seven years later, or six years later, we had seven churches in Melbourne during that time. If you study our history, we are a small group-based church. And we are a church planting movement. We multiply church. That's the reason why we exist. And we've seen this over and over again. I want to tell you a bit of a short story before we finish today. 
The story of this church gateway is a unique church. When I, when I was involved in, start, involved in church planting and this work, I had no idea. I had no idea. I'm a software person. I work in Oracle, a technology company. What do I know about starting a church? Right? I knew how to start a business, but to start a church is a totally different ball game. Especially mobilizing volunteers. Right? A church is easy to mo- I mean, it's not easy compared to a business. A business is easy. To mobilize people is so easy in business. You can hire and fire. That, that motivates people. Another way I can motivate people is by compensation. I can say, look, if you, if you meet your target, I'm going to give you a bonus, right? You get paid for it, right? You know, I can't say to, I can, can't say to the Sabbath school coordinator, you know, you're doing a terrible job. It's not starting on time. Instead of starting at 9.30, it's always starting at 9.45. You're fired! The Sabbath school coordinator go, whoopee! I get a year off. I don't need to serve in church anymore. Neither could I say to the pastor, Pastor, if you get another 15 more baptisms, I'll pay you $15,000 bonus. Because pastors don't work for the money. Say amen, pastor. <laughs> pastors don't work for the money. They work for the call of God. Do you understand? We are not a congregational model. We don't work like that. We don't use those sort of drivers to drive change in a local church. But we know that God has called this church up to be a final day movement. And so we need to find a new way. And I have to unpack the way I do church because I learned the corporate way and not everything in the corporate way can work in the church. Does that make sense? Because church is a holy enterprise. It's God's church. And there are ways that we can do that is of good discipline and good methods, but not necessarily adopting the secular approach. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Right? We will follow what biblically God teaches in terms of leading the church. And I realized we need to find a new way to do church. I was in Australia by then for many years, and I see churches decline. I see Sabbath school decline. And many well-meaning people said to me, Johnny, why don't you uh, read this book, read that book, read this book? And I began to realize, you know, every book from many denominations purport to be the best church growth matter. And I say, you know what, I'll just go back to the Bible. Let me read the book of Acts. Let me see the New Testament. How did that church grow? And all these ingredients came up to my mind. And I began to read two other books that help out. This book is entitled Evangelism by Alan White. Another book called Gospel Worker by Alan White. These two, three books together, New Testament, Evangelism, became the textbook for helping us to go from revival to discipleship to care groups to church planting. So, God bless the work as we move from one stage to another. It started with a, uh, from our, our mother church, which is 40 minutes away from the city of Melbourne. And Melbourne was growing rapidly. We had 100,000 people living in 400 high-rise apartments. How do you reach this city? You can't even do letterboxing, you can't do door knocking, but how do you reach the city? We begin to form groups, begin to train the army of people, and gradually we begin to form more and more groups. We, we train our members about Adventist identity. We studied the books of Daniel and Revelation. Their hearts were stirred. People realized that we have a message to the world and the love of the Bible is awakened. And we begin to follow this model in education, page 191. And when that happened, we had a true revival. And the Spirit of God gave us an urgency of the message. Sometimes the reason why churches are not growing is because there's no urgency. There's no urgency. If I say, fire... Fire. Hello, guys. There's a fire in this building. It, there's no urgency. Do you understand? But if I cry out, fire! Get out of here! Right? There's urgency. What happened? Everybody get up. Now you're awakened. Right? <laughs> but, you know, we need to get that fire in our heart in the Word of God again. Amen? We need to get going to know the books of Daniel and Revelation because I'm so glad you guys are doing a series here because this is our identity. This is who we are, some day Adventists. And that's why Amazing Facts focus on these sort of messages because we need to get this message to the dying world. And when hearts are stirred, we begin to uh, disciple them. We put them to training. We put them, and then after the training, we put them into small groups. And from, we call it care groups. We learn about care groups. Care stands for Christ, attitude, reflected in everybody. C A R A, Christ, attitude, reflection, and That's what we call it, care groups. And from these care groups, more and more begin to grow from two groups uh, in the city, downtown Melbourne, 
uh, we begin to form one group and then form another group and then it became more groups around and then by 2003 we planted a church we spent two years just building small group ministry building the base gathering people gathering people it's all about people because church is about people isn't it yes and so and then we begin to form new ch- a new church plant happened from there and this is the location we hired a university of melbourne a lecture hall and the attendance begin to grow from year to year and we realized you know what we need to grow we need to multiply we cannot just be happy with 150 people 160 people 170 people the lost work needs to go out so we begin to train more people we begin to run more revival discipleship and care group in the east part of the city so on the eastern side of the city we we started to plant another church and this is our, our second church in 2008. And God blessed that growth in the west side of the city. We do the same. We did more care groups around the west side of the city. And this is our church in the west side of the city in 2012. And then we continue to do more work. And we say we're going to do the northeast side of the city. The conference had this suburb for 40 years saying that we need a church there. We need a church there. We need a church there. Very affluent suburb part of Melbourne. Very difficult to reach. If you know Melbourne, is the Domville, the Doncaster, the Temple. So this is a very affluent area of Melbourne. How do you reach this affluent area? The gates are high. It's locked all the time. But how do we reach? Go back to the Bible. We just use home groups. We use outreach using this method. Because by running outreach through the care groups, the care groups are living in the community. They know the people and they reach out to the community. And this is our fourth church today. So we were excited about that. And then COVID hit us. 2020. I don't know about you guys, but in Melbourne, we were shut down for 264 days. There were times we couldn't even get out of the house uh, more than five kilometers. We can't walk more than five kilometers. I thought I was living in China. We call him Chairman Dan. I couldn't believe it. I, 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 my grandparents left China many years ago for the sake of freedom. And I couldn't believe that the Australian laws actually can change when the Premier declares emergency. I didn't know that. I didn't know how easy it is, how easy it is to lose our liberty. Some of us have forgotten about COVID now, but some of it may be fresh in your mind. So we begin to do more work and we realize during COVID, because we are a church based on all these small groups, we move very quickly and remain connected because our small groups remain connected whilst we cannot come to church building the church building shut down we could go to the homes and we're used to doing that we're going to the homes and when the homes cannot have more than five people we started to zoom but we zoom together as a corporate church we begin we still remain connected in fact through COVID, our church began to grow we didn't decline when church reopened we were we were back to our full number We didn't have a staging time to wait for people to come back. We were blessed because God provided for this method of outreach using the homes. And so, after COVID, we started doing some work among the young adults. The young adults are into uh, running and we do a lot. We use a lot of fitness and running as an outreach. And this is a bunch of young adults planting our fifth church at the moment. And they're working on that. It's very exciting to see what they're doing. You know, God is moving. In the difficult city like Melbourne, we have seen over 250 baptisms. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord for that. God has blessed the work there. I believe God has a work here too in Astonville and Berliner and around the area. I believe God has people. You have an evangelistic meeting coming in November. Truly believe that somebody will come. If you go out there with the the leaflet that you're going to give to somebody, but your heart don't believe, don't give it out yet. Pray for your heart to believe. It is our unbelief that is stopping the result. Lord, please help me with my unbelief. Clear that in your mind, that indeed the Spirit of God is moving. He's just waiting to connect you both together. Amen? You know, COVID was a dress rehearsal on what could happen. Churches were shut down very quickly. Mandates were made. This happened in China in 1949 when the Communist Party came. By 1951, we lost the entire denomination. We lost it all out. 
We lost our schools, our buildings, our hospitals. We lost all. 3,000 staff. Many were put to re-education camps. I know pastors who were in camps for 22 years because they refused to recant their faith. We lost an entire system. Today, China is still not under the General Conference. It's not. It's totally unorganized territory. I spent two years training and teaching and planting underground churches there. The work is tough. There's persecution. But it gave me a taste. In COVID in Australia, gave me a taste of what it could be, very similar to China. Maybe COVID was just a dress rehearsal to awaken his church, to awaken God's beloved people, to realize that we live in momentous time, that things are happening rapidly before us. In fact, the World Health Organization just recently, in January, says World Health Organization one of a future outbreak just, is just a matter of time. The fatality rate is 20 times more of COVID-19. Now, this is not written by conspiracy theories. This is not written by uh, you know, far left or far right people. This is written by Researchers that are saying, you think COVID-19 was bad? You ain't seen nothing yet. Something's happening in this world. More outbreaks are happening. I don't need to remind you that this could be a, big, could be a time where we, is a taste of an end time to come. This might be the calm before the storm. God is raising up a movement. God, and Ellen White says that not one in 20 will survive the shaking. The time is coming very rapidly. We need to be grounded in the Word of God. We need to connect with Jesus. We need to be, we need to be into witnessing for Christ because they overcame Him with the blood of the Lamb. Amen? Ellen White says, A vision of the night representation passed before me of a great reformatory movement. Among God's people, many were praising God. The sick were healed and other miracles were wrought. And the spirit of intercession was seen, even as was manifested before the great day of Pentecost. She goes on to say, hundreds and thousands were seen visiting family, opening before them the word of God. She's talking about the time will come where hundreds and thousands will be visiting the families in the homes. Because it could be possible that even a building like this may be shut down. It could be possible even a denomination may be shut down under the mandates of the land. So the final work will have to be in the home. So if we are not used to having home groups today, think, think twice. Because it is the method for growing God's work, but it's probably going to be the method that will survive the end time. Maybe we are just in this phase now where there is a delay, but there will be a mild phase to come. And the Bible says there will be a severe phase to come where you cannot buy or sell. My friends, things are moving so rapidly. I wish we have a prophetic update. You can get that on Amazing Facts website and you can see what's happening in the world today that we live in. I just want to make one appeal to you today. We're going to get to a point where we better get our homes ready. If there's ever a time to get into small groups, not just for the sake of what the church leaders here are telling you, not just for the sake because you've got a program coming, but if there's ever a time to prepare to get into small group, it is now. Because it's a calm before the storm. How many of you say, Lord, today, I see Jesus' method of reaching out and I want to open up my home. I want my home to be Jesus' home. I want my home not to belong to me, but people will be blessed because people come to my home because they will see Jesus and transform. How many like to see that in your home? Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that Jesus models it to us. And Jesus wants to bring love into our home. Lord, I want to pray for every home represented here. That Jesus is not only resident in that home, please come into the home, but Jesus will be the president of that home. Father, if there be contention, if there be relationship, if there be struggles, come and bring peace into that home. 
But Father, I just pray for every hand that was raised, that every home could be a blessing for Jesus. It would be a home that opens up for a meal, for hospitality, for a neighbor, or a friend. It would be a home that opens up for somebody who cannot afford a place or a meal. It would be a home where people will invite their classmates to come and see a different family. It would be a home where people can invite others for a care group. But Father, I just pray that this church will prepare itself for your soon coming. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this afternoon, I'm going to talk about the practical and nitty-gritty part of it. How do we make that home uh, a, a blessings? What are the tools? What are the lessons? What are the resources? But here's the thing. When you come this afternoon, make sure you bring a question in your mind that you want to get answered. All right? Because I'm going to give a lot of time for questions and answers. Because it's more important for me and for you that we answer the questions that's in your heart and your mind. How do we, make, how do we get trained? How do we prepare ourselves? How do we prepare our homes? Those are the questions we will go through this afternoon. Thank you.